it's Dimitri and Jen here. So we're doing a webinar today on cartography and FME. So the science of making beautiful maps and the art of making beautiful maps as well. So, yeah. So a little bit about who we are. So I'm here with Dimitri. Yeah, uh, I, I have been this safe for 13 years. Uh, doing all kinds of uh, scenarios, realistic, uh, real-world scenarios, uh, playing with data, making cool demos and showing off uh, those demos. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, so my name's Jen. Um, I'm newer to SAVE, so I've been here just over a year now, but I came from a partner in the UK. Um, so I'm on the server experts team, so doing ma mainly support. So you can see our uh, Twitter ha handles here, and if you don't follow us, you probably should because, yep. <laughs> well, we have fun accounts. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then on Q&A today, we've got Dave and Trent. So during the webinar, if you've got any questions, just use the GoToWebinar box to type your questions, and then they'll be ready to answer them. And as well, in the spirit of this webinar, I'm wearing my map scarf, and Dimitri brought a mug. I have, I have my, yeah, map mug. Yep. <laughs> so there we go. So what is cartography, Dimitri? I heard that you asked an expert on the matter. Uh, well, uh, I asked my son while I was preparing for this webinar, what is cartography? And he told me, oh, well, choosing the nice colors. Yep. And uh, uh, he's not wrong. Yes, uh, <laughs> nice colors are really important uh, uh, for making nice maps. And why don't we start there? Jen. Yeah. Why don't we make some very simple, very quick, but yep. really beautiful map? Yeah, I can make a nice map. So, for anyone that's new to FME, this is Workbench. Um, so everything that we do in FME is built inside here. Um, so to start this demo, I've got some shape files, just of some polygons of the world, basically. So countries, ocean, glaciated areas. Um, so I'm just going to add the shapefile reader here and bring these in. So I've got a few that I want to bring in. So I'm going to bring in the coastline, uh, glaciated areas, some, I don't want the lakes actually. I'll just bring in land, ocean, and bring those through into FME. So press OK. And then what I want to do with all of these polygon features is uh, rasterize them. So I'm going to use probably the transformer that seems to come up the most during this webinar, which is the Mapnik Rasterizer. So this is a really powerful transformer if you haven't used it before. If you've got a lot of vector features, you can put them into the Mapnik Rasterizer. It will turn them into a raster and you can control things like the styling, cell spacing, how big you want that raster to be. Um, so it's pretty handy. So I'm gonna add these uh, different feature types to the Mapnik rasterizer in the order that I want them sort of built or rendered as a raster. So I'm going to start with the ocean because we want that at the bottom of the picture. And then you can see for every different feature type that I'm going to send to the Mapnik rasterizer, it creates a new input port for me for the Mapnik rasterizer. So I'll add the land next, then the glaciated areas and the coastline. And just to keep it neat, move that to the bottom. And then inside the Mapnik rasterizer, you can see all of those different features that you're bringing in um, and then how you want to symbolize them. So I know for the top three of these that I'm going to style them as a polygon. So in the drop down list, depending on what you're styling, you can choose the right option. So because I want to make this a beautiful map, I'm going to choose the polygon pattern, which lets me go in here, edit the style. And instead of picking something like maybe sort of dots or things you might see in a typical map, I'm going to use a photo or a picture to be that style. So I've been given some nice watercolor pictures. So because this one is the ocean, I'm going to pick a blue one just to make it look vaguely realistic. And then for the alignment on this one, if I picked local, it means that that polygon pattern would start at um, one point on the feature, whereas I'm going to pick global so that it starts for every feature in the same place so it looks better basically. So next I'll do the land in the same way. So I want to set that to polygon pattern. 
And then for the land, I want a green one because that makes sense and set that to global. And then do the same for the glaciated areas as well. I'm going to set that to a polygon pattern and pick, I just pick a random one. I think this has got lots of different colors in. Okay. And then for the coastline, because this is a line, I just want a nice border around all of the countries. I'm going to leave that set to a line symbolizer. And in here, I'm going to leave it as a black line and just set that to be a little bit thicker. So it's a bit more obvious when the map is produced. And then for the size specification, I'm going to pick spacing. And for that, I'm going to use 25,000. So that means for every 25,000 meters, that will be one pixel in the output raster. So press OK. And then because I just want to view this at the moment, I didn't need to write it out. I'm just going to add an inspector to that raster output port and run the workspace. And here we go. So you can see here that this has made a nice map of the world in pretty watercolor pictures. So I'll play that. Looks really nice. Yeah, wonderful time. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, you can have a diff you can have a play with this with all different things. We've picked nice watercolor background, but we were playing it with photos. You put an apple pie picture as the background for land. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it looks quite cool. You can do a lot with the Mapnik Rasterizer. So, well, of course, uh, there is much more uh, to cartography than just uh, colors. And um, well, I spent five years at the university studying cartography. It would be just about colors. I would know probably everything, but not much more. But well, I, I was busy doing all kinds of things. Uh, but um, we will be talking about uh, several steps, very important for cartographers for making the final nice visualization. Uh, so the, the first step is reading and cleaning the data. We won't touch on that uh, because uh, this was covered in many other webinars before, mostly uh, CAD to GIS. Uh, webinars, uh, then we'll talk about data enrichment, uh, how we make the decisions based on data enrichment. Uh, we'll touch on generalization, styling, and visualization. So that's the outline of today's webinar. So let's quickly go through this. So data cleaning, uh, well, we have lots of useful transformers for uh, preparing data to, to meet uh, the requirements of GIS and cartography. So uh, things like intersector, snapper, can you know, area builder can help you to remove all the problems that your data might have. So if you think that SAFE should make a specific webinar about data cleaning, maybe let us know in your feedback. But uh, we skip this uh, topic, uh, assuming that we have clean data and uh, continue from here. So uh, let's talk about data enrichment. So what do we see here? So data enrichment is the process of adding information to features based on their geometric and attributive properties and their relationships with other features. So <laughs> explain that. <simpler. laughs> that sounds, yes, <laughs> yeah. uh, quite complicated, but well, data enrichment is basically, uh, we would like to let features know something about uh, themselves. So whether they are big or small, uh, whether they are you know, rather roundish or, or maybe elongated, then we also would like to let them know about, the, introduce them to their neighbors, uh, whether they are close to some other features or far. And so basically whether they touch them or maybe are inside or outside. So uh, we can uh, extract this information from a data set, from geometries and attributes. Uh, and then based on that information, make some decisions. So uh, here we have a few useful transformers for that. So some of them probably are very popular and you know, probably know them very, very well, such as area calculator and, or length calculator. Some of them probably not as popular, uh, for, for example, circularity calculator. Um, bounding box replacer is, is, is probably a popular one, but it, the, I don't know whether, um, you know that it can uh, measure how you know uh, elongated uh, or square feature is because it can uh, you can you can use an option of oriented bounding box and then extract its length and width of, of the feature. So those uh, transformers help features to know more about themselves. 
uh, we have a few transformers that help uh, features to learn about the environment they are in. So, for example, uh, spatial relator and overlayers. They will let uh, feature know how they uh, are related to other features around them. For example, whether a point is inside an area. Uh, left right spatial calculator is a good one it allows you to tell whether your uh, point is on one or the other side of something for example a river we'll have an example later today showing why it matters um, stream order calculator is very good for hydrography we'll show this example so and a lot more bonding box accumulator helps you to generalize feature uh, features because it can calculate top for index when you go from one scale to another you can get the number how approximately well uh, how you should reduce the number of features uh, by changing the scale so and so much uh, and, and and even more transformers that doing doing that analysis so let's have a look at a few possible workflows uh, when this data enrichment helps you to make decisions. Uh, for example, we have a data set of islands, we calculate their area, and then we decide, so uh, what, what should we do with, uh, with those islands? Uh, you can see on the right top side, so uh, for example, uh, an island is too small to be kept uh, in a different scale, or on a smaller scale, or on the other hand, an island may be small, but very important for navigation. So you don't want to do to delete it. So we will uh, see how we can deal with that. Or uh, it's, if it's a big island, then we know what to do with that. Or uh, uh, we can calculate the length of rivers and then uh, see whether they, how they related to, for example, uh, into two uh, lakes data set and then compare uh, and maybe make some decision based on that. Very short uh, river can be probably just simply removed, but if that short river connects to lakes, it might be important for navigation. You just don't want to remove such a, such a river. Um, uh, circularity calculator, we can just move to the next slide and I show, I, I show the illustration. Basically, this transformer says how roundish your feature is. So for example, if you take countries like uh, Poland, or for example, Canada, uh, they will have this circularity number higher than countries like uh, Chile, uh, Argentina, or Sweden. You can see for Sweden, it's the number just you know 0 0.1, whereas for Poland, it's uh, 0 0.8. So and based on that, you can make a decision how to label those features. So for example, for Poland, a horizontal label would work better than for Sweden. For Sweden, it's better to write along, uh, well, how it's uh, along uh, the, 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 the feature length, how it's in the direction where it stretches. Um, or for example, a neighbor finder. Uh, it can tell your features uh, what is the closest feature from a different data set to this one or from the same data set. And it not only tells what is the closest feature, it passes some information from, from that uh, feature. For example, here we have a data set of bridges and roads and uh, bridges are represented with points but we would like to show them cartographic do the cartographically correct symbol of, of, of a bridge so when we pass this uh, bridges and roads through neighbor neighbor finder we can find uh, the angle at which a road uh, crosses the bridge pass this information to bridges and then use rotator to place our our uh, bridge correctly so you can see uh, the, 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 how uh, this works on the illustration on the on the right. So now uh, we have a few uh, very specific transformers uh, for, for cartography. We had a big project maybe seven years ago with Natural, natural Resources uh, Canada. Uh, they you know, asked us to create a few transformers that uh, would help them to generalize lots and lots of maps. You can imagine Canada is a big country and has lots of maps and making them manually is, uh, is, is probably just you know, uh, impossible to, to, to generalize uh, those thousands and thousands of maps. So we have this interesting transformer called Stream Order Calculator. And uh, look at the illustration. You can see that uh, my rivers are thin at the beginning when they're getting thicker and thicker. So, and how do I know how to do it? Well, we have this transformer, and I probably should switch to my first demo, this one. So here is this transformer. We can calculate uh, uh, the uh, order uh, attribute 
which basically starts from one and when two rivers uh, merge together uh, with the same number one and one we get two when two and two merge merge then they get number three and so on so uh, by running our uh, hydrography layer through this transformer we can get this hierarchy and uh, basically get the idea how thick uh, each 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 river should become so and we can get it from here and basically after that you already can apply some formula to create the thickness of the line but well i hear here i make some nice trick with these four transformers uh, i also make the river going from thinner to thicker representation uh, by uh, chopping each river into three pieces here with chopper and then uh, counting them zero one two and uh, using this simple expression i calculate the width so to me that was really important because uh during my cartography course at, at, at the university that was a difference between failing and you know passing uh, marks uh, you know being able to show with your ink pen uh, how the, the river flow flow so uh, i wasn't that good at that so i'm really happy that i can use this powerful tool to, to do that i can run this workspace and we can see uh, the uh, how it looks like closer so did you pass that course well eventually i did but well i, I never i never liked doing it it was it was strange because in one room we were making all you know, those you know old style uh, manual work whereas in the other room we were making some Know, digital uh, cartography and, and GIS uh, but I never did that after the university <laughs> so it was always digital for me so uh, let zoom in and have a look so this is the vector representation it doesn't have any thickness set but we can see we have here uh, strata order so this one should be one and this one is one this one is two and so on this one must be even higher yeah 15. Um, but if you now look at the magnet map we can see how they flow rivers should flow uh, and that's embarrassing I didn't <laughs> just uh, okay let's go back to the presentation um, so we show uh, we showed how we can enrich data for making some decisions based on which we can generalize our, our data. Uh, so generalization uh, it's not uh, it's not always that you have to do generalization, but it's an important um, step uh, when we make maps. Uh, so why would you want to do generalization to your data? Well, because uh, you can make a uh, map uh, covering bigger area and then probably you don't need that much uh, of the detailness uh, on that map for example if you have you know, all the houses and then you go to one uh, to a map say one to one hundred thousand then you, you basically don't need all those uh, buildings on that map uh, or you can just simplify the shapes because you cannot show all the vertices all the all the all the little details of every shape uh, at that scale so basically make it simpler and uh, cover the bigger area so we have a few useful transformers uh, generalizers uh, which simplify the uh, geometries uh, we have some features to combine areas together uh, dissolver is a very very popular transformer area amalgamator probably is not uh, that uh, well known and that popular uh, we can change geometry types for example we have uh, poly uh, narrow polygon representing roads we can replace it with its center line the center line replacer or we have uh, for example uh, a city represented uh, with a polygon we can replace it with just a point when we uh, uh, make uh, go to a smaller scale uh, sometimes we have to modify geometries to meet our requirements so i will show a couple of examples with that so before we move on to the next slide we've got a little poll to see if people are using these transformers for data like data generalization if yeah. people have had experience using these i i'm really curious to know yeah so hopefully that should come up and everyone listening should be able to vote yep there we go i can see some numbers coming in 
So just while we're waiting for the people to vote, you've got two generalizers here, the generalizer and the Sherband generalizer. What is the difference between those two? Well, a generalizer uh, is a good transformer with lots of options, uh, but sometimes, uh, well, it's well, it's basically not smart enough uh, okay. <laughs> for for certain things. Uh, Sherband generalizer is constraint based, so you can, uh, you know, enforce certain th things, such as, for example, uh, a point should stay on on the same side as it was before. So uh, my next demo will show what uh, bad generalization can mean. For, uh, okay. uh, for you. Okay, so I think most people have voted now, so let's see what so the how... results are. Can you see those results come through? Uh, can yep, I show you... them somehow? Yeah, I think if you press that button. Oh, no, that's your microphone. Uh... I can explain the results anyway, so people yeah. can't see it. So I think Dissolver and or Area Amalgamator got the highest percentage, so 60% of people listening have used one of those or both of those transformers before. And then generalizers and the center line replacer or center point replacer coming in second, so they're pretty similar in what people have been using. And then the displacer has been used the least and the minim minimum area forcer and the curve fitter at 7%. Yeah, so. uh, Curve Fitter is an extra cost plugin for FME. It helps uh, to reduce the number of vertices, so basically make a lighter geometry, by pres but still by, by pre uh, but preserving the, uh, the the shape of, of the features. Yes. So, uh, so let's move to some uh, possible workflows. So here I am expanding my uh, island example. Uh, so uh, a group of islands, we can uh, merge them together an archipelago make it into an island when all the you know narrow uh, uh, passages between them cannot be expressed in the scale you can merge them and just to be, make a bigger island and maybe the small islands we don't uh, want just you know just throw them away they can become a part of a bigger land mass uh, and it's clear with uh, a big island it also can go through area amalgamator uh, because uh, the co the coastline of uh, land coastline can be really uh, curvy and we may need to get rid of some inlets or peninsulas so make them uh, smoother or simpler uh, then uh, if you have a small but important island uh, it might not express in the new scale that we make a new map when we make a new map of, in a different scale but uh, if we have to show it for example, for navigation purposes, we can enforce its minim minimum area. We can make it slightly bigger, uh, and this transformer allows to set the parameters. So a small but important island will become bigger, passing our criteria, and then uh, it will be preserved. Uh, then uh, you can see a couple of other examples. Uh, for example, we have contours. We can drop uh, those uh, those uh, contours that uh, we can divide by 10, only by 10, then if they can be divide, divided by 20 or 100, we can keep them, we can change styles and then simplify. And then uh, we have this transformer displacer here. So we will show it in a second how it works. So, but let's begin with uh, this uh, Sherband generalizer. I can switch to the workspace. Which is here. Um, I can run uh, the workspace with just a normal generalizer. We have a data set with uh, rivers and uh, we would like to go for coffee this morning. Uh, and here I set it up so that I just have to choose which path my features, which path my features should go through, generalizer or Sherband generalizer. So I pick generalizer this time and run the workspace. So the output goes to um, data inspector. So here is, so I removed everything from this map as you can see. So here is where we wanted to go. So on the right side of this river. So, but after we made the generalization, well, the, our river jumped to the other side. And now, so we stay on this side of the river and cannot get our morning coffee and we are grumpy and the day, well, does not go well. So now uh, we have this short bend generalizer. Uh, I will run it first uh, with no spatial constraints. That I say so. It's, it's a transformer that uses spatial constraints. I run it, 
through Sherden generalizer, just like that. So same thing happened here. Our original map and generalized map. But now we will enforce. Uh, so we will say that sideness is important here. Sideness, that's what we are interested in. We run it again. And now we can see that, well, we are lucky today we get our morning coffee. So that's uh, this transformer. Next one is displacer. Yeah, I can go to my next down. Uh, so you made a nice map, send it to your QA. Let's have a look what we get. And QA says, no, this is not how, how the world works unless you live somewhere close to some gravitational anomaly. So your contours cannot cross your lakes. So this is obviously a problem. It looks nice, but wrong. Uh, we have a displacer transformer, which can help you uh, to make a right decision about these situations. I will go back to my displacer and say run it with displacement. Here. So now our contour goes around the lakes not crossing them. So how it works, basically here we say how far the feature, one feature should go, the, the, the base feature, no, 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 the candidate feature, how far should it be, uh, you know, uh, from, from the base feature, which is our lake. And stiffness control, how, how much this feature should change its shape. So bigger numbers uh, will make it uh, smoother, but maybe well it will destroy the the original picture more. So you 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 can play with this number. So five seems pretty pretty nice. One, uh, if I set it to one, it makes it uh, look a little bit unnatural. Ten displaces the, the the contour much much more than I would like to. So, and here is another example where you would want to use a uh, displacer, a real cartographic example. Uh, when you reduce your scale, uh, your features become, well, you draw them uh, much wider than they really are. For example, a three millimeter road uh, in scale, uh, if, you, if you draw your road three, uh, three millimeters wide on 100,000 scale map, uh, it represents 300 meters on the surface. So uh, then it usually uh, it easily can cover some important features such as such as railway. So by using displacer, you can get this nice effect when your features will be moved a little bit aside so that uh, your road your your railway does not go go on over the road surface. Then area amalgamator. It's uh, we got the algorithm, the idea of this transformer from NRCAN and Natural Resources Canada, and I made the original workspace, which later was turned into uh, the proper C++ code. Uh, uh, here we take Philippines, and um, basically we triangulate all the areas, all the you know free space between the islands. Uh, we fill them with triangles, then we measure those triangles, and uh, based on the parameters that we set, we either keep those triangles and turn them into land or uh, uh, remove them, keeping them separate. So, uh, so this transformer, as you can see, can be used for generalization of archipelagos or uh, some uh, shapes that you know, have lots of uh, inlets or peninsulas. Uh, in this case, I use it for labeling Philippines. Um, I create this... Uh, feature, uh, the, the blue feature in the middle, which does not really exist, but um, uh, we use it for placing this ni nice label with uh, map text labeler. So you can just see the picture on the right. I have the workspace actually. So all the workspace that I'm showing today, uh, you, will, you will receive them with the follow-up email and you can play with, with this uh, functionality. Um, 
So now, uh, so we showed you how we can uh, enrich data, how we can generalize data. Now we can talk a little bit about data visualization. So what is important? We already talked about colors, uh, colors and styles. Uh, labels is an important part of making a nice map. Uh, and often when we go to, 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 when we make nice maps, often the raster is either used somehow or uh, is the target, uh, our destination format. So um, we already showed map rasterizer, raster hill shader adds some nice details to, you know, can be used as a background map. For example, if I go back a few slides here, you can see I used uh, this hill shader as a, a background map for, for this uh, topographic map. Um, stylers, we have a few stylers. You can just type in, in uh, workbench styler and you'll get quite a few of them. Uh, what they basically do, they just create a few format attributes representing things that you can set. Usually it's, it's, it's color, it's uh, cell or block for MicroStation or AutoCAD, uh, line styles, uh, uh, line uh, with uh, text uh, parameters such as font, uh, maybe uh, patterns for certain formats. Uh, if you don't see your format in here, uh, it does not mean that you cannot style it. So basically, what, as I said, what they do, they just add some format attributes to, to features. Uh, so you can use attribute creators to do the same job for your format. And also, it means that you can create a custom transformer that would do the same thing. So for example, I create Minecraft styler. It's my custom transformer where I make uh, set up you know, styles for, for making Minecraft uh, worlds. Uh, then uh, labeling is an important uh, step of uh, making nice maps. We have a couple of standard transformers, labeler and label point replacer, uh, which are pretty simple ones. Uh, area labeler is a custom transformer which I created probably 14 years ago, even before coming to save when even we didn't have custom transformers. I had just a workspace. But I made uh, labels, uh, I was labeling areas based on area size. So the, the size of the label was the function of the area. Uh, so you can add some logic to labeling processes and get a, well, get better labels uh, uh, with that. Map text label is an extra cost plugin, but it's really, really powerful, really smart way of making labels for maps. Uh, it's, it's, it's a product within a product. Uh, we had a webinar a couple, maybe three or four years ago about map text labeler. Uh, here is the link to, to this webinar, and we, I wrote a Knowledge Center article about this transformer, and it has lots of examples which you can download and play with them, and you probably can get an evaluation license from, uh, from, from us to, 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 to play with it if you never did that. But uh, it works uh, like that. You define your layers for uh, uh, labeling, and then you apply rules how this label should should be placed. So you have different rules for for linear features, for point features, and for area features. I really, really like this transformer because it allows you know really interesting labeling. For example, and as you can see, I tried quite you know different scales from global to local. Um, check this uh, central Asian countries such as Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, uh, or maybe. Uh, if you go to closer to Europe, to Georgia, how nicely they are placed here. So that's what map text labeler can do for you. Uh, I also tried uh, labeling, uh, you know, city, uh, uh, city, that's the map of Vancouver, and even some um, uh, utility lines, some you know, pipes, and it works really well. So then Mapnik rasterizer, we've already showed you today how it works. Here you can see a few uh, nice examples, a really, really powerful transformer, really uh, a lot of very interesting possibilities uh, from this frying pan on the uh, right top side. I just made it for fun. In States, there is a company that make real frying uh, pans for, uh, for, for you know, every state. And I thought maybe I could do that too. Well, I cannot make a real thing, but uh, well, I can make it with mapping, looking looking like this. Uh, and you can see my face again here. That's some contours from Pakistan. And I just you know thought, why don't I try something really creative with that? We showed that a few years ago during our 
uh, monthly webinar, I believe. Uh, and again, uh, we have a recording of that webinar, and there is a really good uh, knowledge center article about that. You can go and read and download all the examples from there. But here is a real world example, so maybe a more serious map. So I applied a, a lot of cartographic rule, but I, after a few years, I can see not all, all of them. So it's probably this map wouldn't pass my you know, teachers um, at the university, but well, it looks nice, I believe so. But you can see I, I used a lot. I used uh, simplifying contours, uh, just uh, removing some of them. My roads are wider. Uh, I have less uh, elevation points and so on. And then uh, the, the mapnik was used to make it, you know, to style it in a nice way. So now um, we can talk about uh, formats or destination where your map can, can go. Uh, we showed you uh, that we can go to rasters. Of course, we can go to CAT and GIS formats. That's why we showed you stylers. Uh, PDF is a very good destination format because it's so easy to share PDF documents and it can uh, take both uh, vector features and raster features to make some nice PDF maps. Um, we are adding MS Word uh, and PowerPoint writers to FME 2018, so it's easy to imagine that you can make a nice map, include it in your uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation, add some text and maybe generate some charts with other transformers and basically just have an automated way of ma making your PowerPoint presentations. And uh, you can make rasters such as uh, PNGs, JPEGs, or GeoTIFFs, uh, really high quality, uh, really nice maps, or tile caches. Uh, I can maybe click this link and show you what I mean. So I made this map using the same technique that uh, Jen showed in the morning. Uh, I made a tile cache. I used a web map tiler transformer, which works, uh, creates tile, uh, tiles that you see in Google Maps or Bing Maps or, in, or uh, OpenStreetMaps. But I made it from watercolors. Like you probably saw in Data Inspector Stamen maps. Uh, so I wanted to make something as beautiful as those maps. So I can go closer and closer and closer. And we are going to give the workspace that makes this uh, data set to everyone. And I think it would be really nice if you could play with it and maybe show your creativity and create your own tile cache uh, and maybe share your results with us. Then we could uh, publish them through, well, we can host them and uh, publish through our social media channels. And so you can become famous in FME world with your nice, uh, nice looking map. And I have a workspace here. So how about time? We have enough time. Right? Yep, I think yeah, we've yeah. got time. So the workspace is not is, is not really big. So that's the, the the whole workspace that does everything of what you just saw uh, on that in that H, on that HTML page. So here we do the same job as Jen did uh, by reading oceans, land, and uh, glaciated areas, and we style them here in Mapnik. Uh, here I deal with the coastline. I can go back to this, and you can see that it looks a little bit different on the northwest and southeast sides. So um, I just analyze the angle and calculate the width of the line based on, on the angle. So, but you can go, you know, wild and do whatever, whatever you want, make something really interesting with that. And here I make the uh, reverse flow as I explained earlier, and that's it. So then here I make my uh, web tiles uh, for four zoom levels from, for five, from the zoom level zero to zoom level four and then write them as PNGs. And here I generate a very small, maybe five li uh, 50 lines of uh, HTML uh, that uh, then helps you to display that, that map. So you can play with this, you will get this workspace. And uh, I'd be really happy to see if you could you know, generate something and show us. So, and uh, now uh, we show here FME server, and that should be something really nice. Uh, Jen could tell us about FME server. 
Yeah, uh, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, how can we use this power of generating, for example, tile, tiles on the server or in the cloud? I think any of these, it allows you to do it automatically and really scale it out. So on FME server, if you've got people, even, <clears throat> even for the other formats and destinations, if you need to automate this process of making these maps and generating these tile caches, FME server is really good for that. So people can start to self-serve their data. So instead of maybe sending you, oh, I want a map for this area, Dimitri, can you go and make it for me? All you'd have to do is send that request to FME server and then it handles it all for you. So it makes it a lot easier and quicker to do. Yeah, and I'm, I'm currently, I can, I can tell you, uh, I'm playing with, um, with a scenario where I try to create hundreds of thousands of those tiles uh, in the cloud. Uh, it's not directly related to the topic of our webinar, uh, but here is an example which I create. Uh, well, it, it is related because I created this nice map for that. 500,000, uh, 600,000 tiles I created in less than an hour, maybe in 50 minutes, not even really optimizing uh, uh, the, the, the distribution of engines and, and, and the workload on the server. So uh, on my machine, that would probably take a few days to generate that. Uh, but we sh we'll share our results uh, when we get them later. So uh, now we can go back to our webinar. Um, once I made this experiment trying to write, um, make nice maps in different formats, and uh, I used uh, all the uh, styling uh, capabilities and map text labeler to write uh, out to make some outputs for ArcGIS, GeoMedia, DWG, AutoCAD uh, for MicroStation, for MapInfo, and for PDF. And again, those results are publicly available through map text labeler webinar. Uh, even if you don't have map text labeler, you still can use them just to replace maybe map text labeler with um, normal labelers and try to get some uh, similar results. Um, but that's, that's how, how it can work uh, in any destination system so, or play with, with your own system and try to get something nice. Uh, there is a lot of you know, data to play with and we give it to, to you to, to, to try to, to, to see how it works. So now uh, Jen uh, asked uh, our customers, our partners, to share the results, what they do with FME and um, in terms of nice maps, and uh, she can share some uh, of the results. With yeah. You. yeah. So we put out a question on Twitter and on the Knowledge Center to try and find out what kind of maps people are making with FME. So the first example got Dimitri really excited. Um, so this is Owen Powell in the UK. So. He wanted to make something that replicates the first British road atlas, which came out in 1675, but do that all in FME and sort of automate that process instead of have to do it manually for the whole country. Um, so yeah, this, this was all done in FME using the ordnance survey data. Um, and this was showing a section of the route from London to Banbury. So they've used FME to create different panels that shows you along the route as it goes. So they use the shortest pathfinder to find the route from London to Banbury, like the quickest route there, all along A roads. So it visits through towns and villages, whereas if you were doing a motorway, it would probably just bypass all of that and it wouldn't be as exciting to look at. Um, so what this map is doing is not showing you everything in that panel. It's only pulled out features that intersect with the road route. So you can do that using the feature reader. So you only end up reading in the features that you want, which in this case are the features that intersect the route. So all of these different panels were made using a tiler and then scaled an offset to make them in the right way and give them that kind of scrolly look um, to them. And then also able to work out which towns are along the way. So you've got these sections of the map where it says, to a place. So you've got to Bushy, Northwood and Ruslip. Um, so basically any, any towns that were along that route, they've all been concatenated just with a comma to make that fit into the map nicely. Um, so that was all styled as well, output through the Mapnik rasterizer. 
So if you're interested in reading out what actually went on in this workspace in a little bit more detail, so I put the link to his WordPress on the slide before. So you can go and check that out. There's loads of cool maps on there that he's been making. And then another couple of examples of maps that Owen's made with FME. So on the left hand side, we've got this sort of like mountain profiles. So FME was used to sort of take the DTMs of these mountains, create a profile, turn them into polygons so they're flat on the map and then style them that way. So you can actually see the mountains as if they've been sort of like pushed over and flattened onto the map, which is pretty cool. And then on the right hand side, you've got oceans. So you've got the waves as if you were kind of looking at the sea. So this was Ed, or change from the Cloudifier transformer. So this is one that he's published up to FME Hub. So if anybody out there makes these custom transformers and thinks they'd be useful, you can publish these up to FME Hub so other people can download them. So when you're in Workbench and you start typing and you can download those transformers, I think they're a bluey, no, a green color. The normal ones are blue. Those ones are transformers that people have put up on the hub. So this one is taking straight lines across and then just turning them into arcs. And there's a bit of variance and randomness in here to make the waves not look neat and uniform. And then another example here. So Holly from Sterling Geo in the UK as well has also been working with ordnance survey data. So this one is styled more traditionally as the ordnance survey would typically style it. So they provide styling files with all of their products that they give out, so the vector products. And then you can go in there, pick out sort of what kind of lengths, not lengths, widths of lines you might need, what the colors are, convert those into FME colors, and then put those into the workspace so the FME can style it correctly. So in these examples, so Sterling's part of a sort of a utility, they inspect substations and power lines and things like that. So a lot of maps needed to be made for the engineers so they know where they're going out in the field. So these requests used to come in, it would be pretty quiet for a while and then you'd end up with like five at once. So having FME to be able to just automate that process, cut out the vector products and then supply it makes it a lot easier. So this is the workspace that creates those. You can see a feature reader here. So like with Owen's workspace, this is only reading in features that are needed for the area of interest or that intersect that. And then they can be clipped to the area of interest that's provided, uh, splitting these out all into their different features, because you're going to want to style road separately to a railway track or to a river. And then instead of manually setting each style in the Mapnik rasterizer, you can use attributes to set the styling. So if you need to do it different styling by uh, on a feature by feature basis, in this example, they've used an attribute value mapper to take all the different sort of variances within a road, for example, you might have big roads, small roads, main roads, motorways, and then they all need different styling rules. So in the attribute value mapper, those rules have been manually set. So every time this workspace runs, the Mapnik rasterizer can set the right style to the right feature, basically. And then for the next examples we got, um, I was actually pretty tempted to not credit this slide. I figured putting a picture of a map on here with a bike in it would give it away who this has come from. And as soon as we put the question out on Twitter, everyone's like, oh, Hans, Red Geographics. So, yep, he came through and sent some maps, map examples through to us. So the one on the right is probably the simplest um, example we had. So these were a lot of geo tiffs that he mosaic together and then was cutting out different sections to go on these signs. So we think in the end, FME ended up cutting out over 500 different areas of maps to go on these signs. And then the image on the left, so the base map was actually produced from different software, but what FME has done is been able to work with the vectors on top of that. So you can see some of the things on here. So this is for workers who need to go out and hammer sort of posts in the ground to direct people who are hiking. So you can see took me a while to spot it, but around the colored line, sort of like the bottom left, going diagonally from bottom right to top, there's like a black outline around there. So buffered the section of the route that they're gonna be working on. And the black dots are added in for the start and the end nodes. And then you've also got the roots colored. So you've got a orange route, a red route and a blue route. And you can see those colors sort of 
go on the same route together where those routes overlap, which is good. And then another example that he sent through, so this ties back to what Dimitri was talking about earlier, so for generalization. So you can see the small black numbers along the main routes. So the original data for this was having marks every 100 kilometers for longer roads. But when you change the scale of the map and you need to make it a lot bigger, you don't want those roads cluttered a lot with it, like a number every 100 meters. So instead, FME was used to sort of generalize this and then have a marker every five kilometers instead. Um, it was also used to add some labels to this map. So for highway exits, junctions and rest stops. So for things like those, you need to make sure they're on the right side of the road. So if you've got a rest stop and you're driving along one way on these big roads, you can't normally just turn across the traffic. So you need to make sure that if you say desperate for the toilet while you're driving along, you wanna know that you're coming up to the rest stop on the right side of the road. Um, and then as well for finding these, uh, for finding the nearest highway, um, he was doing some calculations on the azimuth and then adding a rotation attribute at a 90 degree offset so that, that would get labeled right. And then another example that was sent through from Joanna. So these came through on the Knowledge Center. So if anybody saw that question posted, these maps were posted in response to that. So you can see on the left hand side, there's a lot of labels on the map. And she was saying that it was hard to know or how hard to label it correctly. So you didn't end up with too many labels grouped together in one place. You wanted it to be readable and actually make sense. And then the example on the right hand side is a little bit different because we've added tick marks along the border of the map and a scale bar as well. As uh, this is just another example of that from a workspace template that she sent through. Um, so what this is doing is similar to the other people who have used the Mapnik rasterizer and added that styling in. Instead of setting that styling manually through like attribute value mappers or maybe just in the Mapnik rasterizer directly, all that styling information was kept in the CSV file which contains all the different colors and the priority of the features. So that when this gets read in to FME, you can use a schema mapper to add that attribution on top of those features. And then the Mapnik rasterizer can use those values to style the map. Uh, so add the tick boxes around the outside was a bit more involved. So there's a private parameter set up to work out sort of the size of the map that was going and then it can work out what the tick marks need to be and how many of them need to be on the map. Um, so that then has to loop through the minimum sort of side of the map, keep going until it hits the big one. Um, so those ones are a little bit more advanced, um, but you can still make great maps as shown with a Mapnik rasterizer through here. So if anybody has FME maybe for work, but they wanna take it home and play with. We're doing FME home use licenses now. So this was announced at the user conference back in May in Vancouver. So you can go online, you can submit a request to get a home use license and then go home and then ruin your family's life because you're gonna be stuck on your computer all the time playing with FME. But then so, you can make really wonderful watercolor maps. Yeah. I showed you. Yeah, I you made it at home. You don't need to spend time with friends or family, just. <laughs> play with ever me. So yeah, and one thing, if anybody is sort of inspired from the webinar and has any cool ideas that they want to try out, I would say build it and then keep an eye on the Knowledge Center next week or the Safe blog, because we're gonna be putting up a challenge up there for the holidays. So more details on that coming soon. So just keep an eye out if you wanna make cool things with FME and then get your home use license in ready for that, so. So we have four minutes. Four minutes. Uh, I realized when you asked me if we had time, that clock has been saying 20 past eight all the time because it was broken. <laughs> so I thought we were, were doing really good and really quick, but, but no. Yeah, we still did <laughs> we really well. So could you have a look? Uh, maybe we can uh, yep. answer a couple of questions. Let's see if I can bring this up. Questions. Oh, okay. Let's see what. Yeah, I mean, could, could you maybe just pull out that section? Yeah. So for David McDermott, there already is a board game club at SAFE, so, yep. Uh, is there anything unanswered? Um, 
looks like Trent and Dave have done a pretty good. Yeah, it looks like yeah, uh, most questions are already answered. Um. Yeah, I guess if you do have any questions after the webinar, you can find us on Twitter if you want to message us on Twitter. Also, the Knowledge Center is a really good place to ask these questions. Um, so there's a Q and A forum on there if you're not sure. Then you've got users. All of the users on the Knowledge Center can then go in and help answer these questions, as well as safe staff also jump in there and help answer the questions as well. So, yeah, yeah. So, and probably with that, we can say thank you for joining us this morning. Yeah. And see you next time. Yeah. Enjoy yeah. the rest of your day. Yeah. So, yep.